Hi everyone, welcome to Rose Hip Knits podcast episode 9. My name is Hannah and you can find me as Rose Hip Chick on Ravelry and on Instagram. There is a blog for this podcast where I try to put all the important links after each episode and that um, blog can be found on rosehipknitspodcast.blogspot.com and I created a Ravelry group. We slowly ticked over 200 subscribers on YouTube and I thought it's about time. So I did go in and create a group in Ravelry. It's just a Rose Hip Knits podcast. And so far there's only one thread um, for welcome where you can go and introduce yourself if you like or ask any questions. Um, it's just up there for anyone who's interested to say hello. And in the future I'll post the podcast episodes in the group and um, I think I'll put some of the links in there as well. So yes, welcome. It's June. Winter has started here in Tasmania and yes it has started. We didn't really ease into the cold weather, it just um, decided to come with June. So we've had down to minus during the night and frost in the morning. It's still be nice and it's still nice and sunny in the middle of the day. I think yesterday it only went up to about ten degrees though, so not very warm. But I think it doesn't get much colder than this here in Tasmania. There might be the occasional really cold day, but really having minus during night is that's cold for here. Sun is shining outside today. It's warmed up a bit. It's about lunchtime. It's Wednesday and I am home today with my youngest daughter. She's having a sleep at the moment, so I think this podcast might last for as long as her podcast her uh, sorry, her nap lasts. We'll see. Uh, sometimes they're longer and sometimes they're a bit shorter. So we'll see. I might have to continue this tomorrow. Anyway, I was really looking forward to recording because the last couple of weeks have been not the best. We've had, oh, sick children, sick husband. We've had some issues with um, our drains. We had a plumber here yesterday and then we had to get the council in because there was a leak on the water main and it was outside the property, but of course affected us and our house. So, um, Yes, it's just been a lot going on and yes, um, I needed a bit of a um, crafty fix, I think. <laughs> we did have one nice thing happening. My daughter turned five and we had um, family over for dinner and we also had a small birthday party. We had three little girls over from her class. They had a little party and had cupcakes and a bit of a play and that was lovely, that was very nice. But I think uh, as long as I can keep it to less than five <laughs> children, um, that would be really good. But I don't know if I can get away with that for much longer. Okay, I have my show notes here again today and over the two weeks I've been scribbling down things so I always end up with quite a few things that I like to say and I never get through. All of it but it's there for a bit of a guideline for me. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Erin from the Holland Handmade podcast. She mentioned me on her podcast and that was lovely. I have um, watched her for um, a few weeks now and I really love her podcast and Erin is just such a lovely person. So thank you, Erin, for mentioning my podcast. Um, and of course, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed. We're over 200 subscribers on YouTube. It's just amazing. So thank you for, for those of you who have watched from the beginning or early on. And for anyone who's 
found me in the podcast um, recently. And please, um, you know, any thumbs up or subscriptions um, are just wonderful and I makes me so happy. So please keep um, clicking on those thumbs up and subscribe. And um, also thank you to those who already found the Ravelry group and um, joined. I think there's almost 30 members now and I haven't really um, sort of gone public <laughs> or to say with, that there is a Ravelry group. I thought I'll, I'll tell you all today. So thank you and um, big thank you to those who actually went into the welcome thread and said hello. It's um, so much fun. I love it. <laughs> um, today I am having rose hip soup from Sweden. I had a packet in the cupboard that has been there for quite a few years now. So it's not the freshest thing, but it's dried anyway when you make it. So I thought it would be okay. And um, I thought uh, maybe later on in this episode, I'll talk a little bit about decisions and decision making. <laughs> because that's something that um, doesn't come easy to me. And to start off, I can tell you, like the name of this podcast, the Rose Hip Knits podcast, um, that comes from me being Rose Hip Chick on Ravelry. And I had such a hard time um, deciding on a name when I was joining up to Ravelry. So I joined up in April 2008, and I'm not sure if Ravelry maybe started 2007, but I had known about Ravelry for quite some time, and I just tried to um, come up with a name that would sort of describe me a little bit, and it took me months, I think, and then I thought, okay, well, rose hip soup is something that is very common in Sweden, and it's something that I love, and you can't get hold of it in Tasmania or Australia. I think you might be able to get it at IKEA. But we don't have IKEA in Tasmania, so we have to go to Melbourne or Sydney. Um, and so that was just something that sort of came to my mind, and I thought, okay, well, that sort of describes me. It's sort of Swedish, and I can't get hold of it here. It's a bit different, I guess. And um, so I just made it roast hip chick, and that's been the name since 2008. So when I wanted to do a podcast I just thought oh, I'll do something that sort of is similar to my Ravelry name and it's Rose Hip Knits and I do love roses and rose hips I guess so <laughs> that's the name so that's a bit about decision making it doesn't come easy to me and um, I just want to get things right and that makes me take too long to make decisions anyway enough talking about nothing. Um, I have some finished objects today. I have some works in progress and some spinning and some things that I'm planning to do soon. So since last episode, Stash Das has started and I have so far cast off four projects. So last time, oh, I'll show you this one first, and I just took it off the, um, the drying rack. This is the Sweet Bunting Cardigan by Laura Shaw, and I made it in the Bendigo Woolen Mills Classic 8-ply in the Silver Twist colourway. I've weaved in the ends and everything, but I haven't cut off the ends. Um, and I just used some scraps for the, the blue string and the teal bunting. My gauge was not as the pattern suggested, so I cast on for the smaller size to get about a two-year-old size. So since last time, I just made one button band and I have washed it and weaved in all the ends, of course, and it's just been drying on the towel. And um, I never really block anything except for shawls. I just... Um, hand wash and then put them on a towel to dry flat and if there's an edge or something that is 
has a tendency to roll up, I'll just go and sort of press it down every now and then and pull the garment to size. And that seems to work okay for me. So that's off the needles. Yay. And it will be a present for a friend in Sweden and her uh, little boy. Uh, another thing I was working on last time, and that's finished now, are the little squirrel socks by Tin Can Knits. And I made them in a, I think it's Norwegian um, yarn. It's a wool nylon DK weight yarn. And it's called Fjell by Hefa. And I used contrasting colour for toes and heels so that I could enter them in the Foxes in Socks catch-up cow. And I cast on for a medium adult size, which was not um, intentionally. I was going to do the small size, but I don't know. I got the numbers wrong. So they're quite um, wide. And of course I have small feet, so they're short. They're my size in the length, but they're a bit big around the foot but I like them they're good and as soon as I had um, cast off these ones I decided to start a new pair using the the leftovers of of both colors but I just did a, a basic um, vanilla sock and I can't remember I did end up looking up a pattern just to see um, like some basic directions for how many stitches to cast on the heel and everything. But I made these and they're a, a toe up with an afterthought heel. And all the um, details are on the project page on Ravelry for these socks and everything else that I talk about. I put down how many stitches I cast on for socks and I have all the, um, the yarn linked in the projects and needle sizes and everything like that. But I made these. So I just kept going and I just put in um, scrap yarn for the afterthought heel. Kept going until I was maybe halfway up here and then I went back and I put the heels in and I did that for both of them just to see how much um, yarn I had and if I could use any of it up here and then I continued and um, I ended up having only a tiny bit of the pink left the solid colored pink but when, I just wanted to use every last bit of it so when I cast off I ran out of the main color so I, I used the ends down here from the pink to cast off so you can see I haven't I, I sort of cast off for as far as I could get with the main color and then I just used a bit of the pink and the same on the second sock and again these are all washed and um, in stuff sewn in and everything but I haven't cut them off but they, they're quite short and these socks are much tighter on the foot than the other ones but they're really nice house socks. So I'm, I'm very happy with those. So that's the second pair of socks and second projects for Stash Dash. And last time, I think I'd only just cast on my opal socks. And here I have one finished. And here's another one finished. So with these, um, I tried on the, um, I tried the Chiago 23 centimeter, nine inch circulars. And um, I think I told you last time that casting on first and getting started was quite tricky. But actually, it's um, it was so fast going. It was, I think, just not having that time of doing the magic loop 
and not getting to an end of a round. Like you just keep going and going and there's not really a start or a finish to the round. You just, and then with the self striping, just like, I just finished this stripe. Oh, I just finished the next one. So it was fast. And I really like how even it looks. I mean, I normally don't get this nice even fabric. So I just started out because I thought with the um, 23 centimeter, I just do the cuff down. Um, so I could just start on that little circular. And then I thought, oh, I'll, um, I'll make it them so that I can enter them in the catch-up cowl for the Soxes in Fox again with the contrasting heels and toes. So I had a look through my stash and I recently got some Fable in the solid colours from Love Knitting when they had a sale on and free shipping. So I put an afterthought heel in. And for this, I basically followed the Lara Linneman Afterthought Heel Socks pattern. Yes, that's what I think they're called. So I put that in and then, no, sorry, I just put the waist yarn in, continued up. But then I actually put the heel in before I completed the toe, just to make sure that I had the right length. Of the foot before I started the toe so I did that loved it and then straight away I made the second one and um, yes yeah, so the opal I think Acapulco is this opal line and then just the fable solid color so um, I really want to cast on a new pair of socks using my tiny little circulars. They were so much fun. <laughs> so that's the fourth project and third pair of socks since last time that I finished. And those four add up to 955 metres to, for uh, Stash Dash. I also finish my spinning. So this is my wool tensile from Creatively Dyed yarn and I did a, um, a two ply and I have uh, washed this and whacked it and everything. So that's all done and it's 226 meters I got it to, so about 225 meters which makes my stash dash total so far 1180 meters and this is about a sport weight I would say it's it's not the most even so it varies a little bit but about the sport I think and you can't really see the color it's just a funny sort of um, light in here today it's it is sunny outside but it sort of comes and goes a bit and it's not direct sun into the, the studio where I am but it's sort of a light pink now that all the colours are mixed. And I, I still think that I'll, I'll eventually make a shawl out of this. It's nice and um, cool to the touch with the tensile. So it's 50 tensile and 50 wool. And I, I spun this, putting a lot of twist into the single. So I had it on a very... I'm not... It's called a high ratio on the wheel. Like a for one thread, or the wheel goes around several times, and then when I plied it, I had it on a lower ratio, so the wheel was not turning as fast for each time I, I pushed a pedal on the wheel. That's how technical I get. <laughs> so that's all done. And then I have, I don't think I've cast anything else new on. I've just um, been trying to finish the projects that I already had on the go. But one thing I did, because the Heart of Wool podcast with Shannon, she, um, she had a spring cleaning cowl, and I talked about that before, 
And what I tried to do was to finish this bag. I have it here. I tried to put handles on this bag and big fail. I didn't succeed in doing that. I tried something and that didn't work and then I just left it. But another thing I did, and it's it's almost complete, but I frogged a cardigan, a Gartio cardigan that I made for Stash Dash 2013. And it just never fit me. So it had hand dye, um, sorry, well, hand dye and hand spun yarn in the yoke. And then the rest of it was the um, Yo Sharp DK wool, green colour. And um, that's the dangerous thing with Stash Dash, that sometimes you just want to just finish all the things. And this card again, I probably... Um, it was stalling a bit and I was not sure about it, but then I just needed the meters for Stash Dash, so I just completed it, thinking it will be okay, it will block out, whatever. No, it didn't happen. And it's been sitting in my wardrobe on the shelf for two years, since like the 2013 Stash Dash, and um, no magic has changed it into fitting me or anyone else that I know, so that was frogged. And I used that DK from Yo Sharp for the antler cardigan for my girl. And I really liked how that came out. So I might make another one of those in a larger size. We'll see. Um, I don't often make a pattern more than once. But I might because it was a nice, easy knit that I really liked. So that's something frogged. <laughs> and then knitting that I'm working on. And I showed you this one that I... I have my blanket in. It has had a little bit of a tension. All the squares that I had so far, I crocheted around. And this is just the mitred squares that I've, I've just sort of instructions for them somewhere and I haven't got like a, a full pattern that I'm, I'm using for it. I just decided in 2009, I think, decided to make um, squares out of this um, yarn that I got from a, a wool shop that I worked in back then. It's a, I think it's from New Zealand, 100% wool. Anyway, I crocheted around all those squares that I had so far and then I laid them out on the floor and I realised that if I could make another three out of the multicultured, sorry, of the multicolored squares there and one more of the solid colors then I could make it a larger size that was quite nice so I've just started so I have another two and out of the I only got to this far on the third one so I'm going to do a blue for the rest for a little bit of interest and then I'll make another one of the orange colors so with those extra four squares, I'll be able to make the blanket a little bit bigger. So I'll complete those four, crochet the grey around them, and then it's time to crochet all of the squares together. And I have been wanting to cast other things on after I finish those other things, but I just thought I'm just going to make myself finish this blanket once for all. I just want to have it done, and then I will reward myself <laughs> with casting on something new but I think that reward will come maybe after I finish those last four squares <laughs> not when the whole thing is assembled so that's that one and then I have a pair of socks on the needles that I have had on the needles for quite some time this is my hand dyed and I'm making two at a time toe up socks I put in a fish lips kiss heel and I can't remember if I had done that last time but I have the heels on there and I have not got much further because those other <laughs> stocks they were just too interesting um, and these ones just they've been just sitting in my bag and they're just sort of if I need to grab some knitting to get out of the house or go out of the house to do something I, I'll take those I'm not in a hurry to get them finished, but um, of course, before Stash Dash finishes, I will have them done. 
but for now they're just a nice project to have available when I need something easy and quick to grab and go. So that's a hand dyed that I did as um, a self striping. I over dyed a um, heirloom sockle jigsaw, I think it's called, and I have shown that previously. If anyone's interested in this previous episode, or you can find it in the show notes for the previous episodes. Um, and then in my bag that I made, and I made one the same for my sister, I have the raindrops um, top that I am making for my five year old girl, and this is in the hand dye that I made that I dyed in a superwash merino. And I am alternating skeins. And um, yes, it's it's so nice to knit on because it's changing quite a lot in the colour and just keeps it interesting. But I had other things that I was working on, so it didn't get a lot of work done on it. But this is really good for just sitting and watching TV. So yes, working on that. I have this much left on the first 100 grams, so it's not using a lot of, of uh, yardage. Um, so they are the things that I have finished, the things that I'm working on, my spinning. And this showing you this bag reminded me that my mother did receive her Mother's Day present and in that present I also had one of these bags for my sister with a, a tea bag in there, coffee lover tea because she quite likes coffee and some chocolate and a bluebird of happiness with some lavender in. For my sister I had that and then I showed you all the items in my mum's present a couple of episodes ago I think and she received that and she opened it with me when we were doing FaceTime. And um, I do think she quite um, enjoyed it and she appreciated all the presents. The lovely um, yellow, follow the yellow brick road shawl designed by Holly Dapp. Um, she had that and she put it on straight away and yes, she was very happy. And even though it's early summer in Sweden, I'm sure she'll still get some use Um that shawl before autumn and winter in Sweden but yes I'm happy she received it she actually opened on Mother's Day she didn't receive it many days before so uh, that was really good and I did have someone um, ask me to please share with you all how mum reacted when she had the, the present and she was very happy Okay, I'll turn my page in the show notes. <laughs> As I mentioned, I have a few things that I really like to cast on and my fingers are itching to do these other things. I said before, we had some really cold nights and cold mornings. And the other day, we had an appointment and I walked to the appointment with my girls and my five-year-old... She was inspecting the frost on the grass and she was quite interested in, and she said she had cold hands. So I asked, oh, well, maybe you need some mittens. She said, oh, yes, pink and purple ones, of course. I said, oh, maybe I should make you some mittens then. Oh, yes, you can make me mittens. And as a knitter, if anyone asks me for something, I straight away start planning for it. And my mum has sent me a, a parcel, a big box actually, not for me, mostly for my daughter for her birthday with birthday presents. But she also put in quite a few skeins of wool for me that she has got at different events and different sales and things over the quite a few months um, thinking of me and that I'm coming to visit her. So she was probably thinking that I could take it when I, I go there. 
but then she was sending this um, box of presents to my daughter and she could just um, stuff it in there so she did and there were a lot of um, there was some opal and other sock wool but also there was some um, lubica which is I think in this it's those skeins here there's four of them and I have some here in a pink dark purple and light purple and these are the colors that my daughter picked out for mittens for her so this is the really bulky 100% wool that is used for traditional Swedish mittens called Ludvika mittens and this is from Ullcentrum a Swedish company and yarn store I'm not exactly sure how to describe it but she got to choose from the different colors and I had green in there as well and she said not green mommy I don't like green so pink and purple it is she did ask for um, yellow but didn't have yellow so it's pink and purple so I've been I've scanned these up and I have found a pattern for Luvica for for children from Yerbu and um, I'm going to cast that on next. I just need to find needles that will be suitable. I'm not sure if I'll have to use DPNs or if I have a circular that will work. But yes, I want to do those and I want to do them soon because it's cold now. <laughs> so that's um, coming up. And yesterday, Holly Dapp of the Swift Knit Podcast sent me a pattern for her latest shawl design. It's called Autumn Morning Shawlette, I'm pretty sure. And um, I'm going to test knit that for her. And I really, really wanted to cast it on straight away. I've been waiting for her to send me the pattern. And um, then I thought, no, I'll, I'll work on my blanket. But now I'm also struggling with what yarn to use. I don't, I don't need to go and buy anything. And I have several hand dyed and hand spun, but I don't really have anything soft. And I've made that mistake before that I have used beautiful yarn that I've hand dyed. And it's just a little bit too scratchy because most of what I have dyed is sock wool so it has a wool nylon content and then I I thought I sort of decided on this hand dyed that I did recently and this is um, Athena from Bendigo Woolen Mills in the four ply and Athena is it was a limited release that they did and it's a wool bamboo silk and this is also what I, I made my play date cardigan in from Tim Canets when I did that test knit for them so I have that and I need the two colors and I was going to dye another color but then I thought maybe I should just see that's the Athena I thought maybe I should just use that ivory color for the edging has a moss stitch edging and then uh, there's a few cows going on with shawls that I'd like to join in on of course I can go a bit crazy like that so skein yarn have they just started a shawl knit along with using hand dyed so I could enter using this and then Cozy Crafting Podcast with Abby and the Foxes in Socks are doing a joint knit along with stripy shawls. So then I could stripe this using Holly's pattern and she did say it's okay for me to stripe it. So I'm thinking about that, not really sure if I'll, I'll do that or not. And then the Foxes in Socks also has they have the catch-up cow still for another month until end of June 
and Heat Your Neck was one of their cows that you can catch up on. So a shawl would go for that. So, mm, not sure. I think having a lighter coloured shawl would be really useful for me because I have a lot of blue ones and green ones, purple, like darker colours. And yes, having a lighter one would be nice. I'm just not sure that having that moss stitch edging would look good in the ivory colour. So I'm sort of thinking about this as I'm finishing my blanket. And um, yes, we'll just have to see <laughs> what happens. Maybe next time um, I'll talk to you, I'll show you start of a shawl. So that's all the crafting, I think. It is, the sun is disappearing outside now behind the trees and the clouds and it's getting a little bit cold here. I actually have the door open and uh, yes, it's um, fresh. <laughs> Sorry, just have a bit of my drink. I had a question after I talked about how I ended up where I am now in Tasmania with two children and a husband when I'm actually from Sweden and I just briefly talked about that I came here to do my studies and then I did some research and, and things down in Hobart and I had a question asking me to maybe talk a little bit more about my studies and my research that I've been working on and I think if I wanted to talk about decisions and decision making, this can sort of fit into that. Um, because I, I went to university to study environmental science and marine science. And always having a hard time making decisions. I always sort of aim to, in school, to do as well as I possibly could and then just sort of go for the option that was like what I could get into with my my grades so I got into science and then environmental science at uni and that was I thought it's I was really interested in the subjects and I also thought it it can never be aiming as high as you can and and going for the option that you know you you can that's the highest you can reach for with your results in school not sure if I'm explaining that correctly but yes I always I thought I, it cannot be wrong if I keep choosing the option that is the the one that is the hardest to get into but I just sort of managed to get through in that direction so that's what I did in um, high school and university and everything and then I always wanted to travel and I've been volunteering with sea turtles in Greece. I went to Nepal on a UN founded exchange program after two, I think after two years at uni and um, I've just been searching out these opportunities to go traveling without actually just sort of pay a huge amount to go on the flight and on a holiday. I've been trying to volunteer and so I get free accommodation and just sort of going with um, scholarships and things like that. So at university also there was, I got the scholarship to go to Australia for a year. So I did that. And I studied a lot of marine science there because at my university in Newcastle because my university in Sweden didn't really have a lot of marine biology then they do now and um, yes yeah, so I sort of ended up with all those things because I thought I'll just go for that the option that is not the hardest but the 
harder for me to get into. Oh, I'm not explaining that very well. And uh, with my research, I I completed my studies, went back to Sweden, completed them, and then I did my master's thesis. And I wanted to come back to Tasmania, so I just looked for anyone who was interested in me coming to do a research study with them. And I did end up doing my thesis on bycatch in the lobster fishery and around the Tasmanian coast. So I was out on fishing, fisheries boats and commercial fishing vessels and looking at what they caught in the traps that they catch lobsters in. So we were looking at octopus and lead jackets and like different species of fish. And I did that for about six months and then I got some contacts in fisheries research and then I was able to do a little bit more work for them when I came back after I finished studies in Sweden. Then I worked a little bit with Tasmanian devils as an animal keeper and then I got a job with a consulting business and we did a lot of work with different environmental impact assessments for different developments and fish farms and lots of different things. So that's um, a little bit more about what I studied and the research and work that I have done in that field. And now, of course, I don't do any of that anymore. I hope to get back to it, but at the moment I do bookkeeping. So it's all about numbers and um, filing reports to the tax office and things like that. Um, yes, yeah, so I um, I do have a hard time making decisions, and I just want to get things. Right, I don't want to choose something and not be able to change my mind and choose the other options. So I always think if I choose the option that will leave all the other options open in a way. You know, if I go for studying science instead of studying, I don't know, hairdressing. Really, that's a, not the best example but you know you can study science and then you can go back and do a hairdressing thing if you like but it's very hard to go into doing hairdressing and then try to get into science so <clears throat> that's what I've done and I've, I, I've been thinking about this lately that here raising children in a country that's not the, the country that I grew up in it is big problem having a hard time making decisions because here I don't have the same reference frame for decision making. If I was in Sweden with my children I'd have a background I know sort of everything with healthcare, childcare, schools, you know, anything like different sports, anything like that. I'd, I'd have experienced myself and a background knowledge that would help me wake, making decisions what to do with my children and <clears throat> sorry and here the oh, the culture for raising children is totally different schooling is different it's I mean you I think all students at the end of year 12 or whatever are on a pretty even place in their education in here in Sweden and other countries um, but the way to get there I think is quite different here you start school like my daughter is five she's out of school it's only kinder and it's only five days or ten days a month and it's not really school but it is in the school in the school building So that's different in Sweden. I didn't start until I was seven. 
and I know now like they have the six year old preschool group and so it's also different to when I grew up but it still seems like they start much younger here and you know have a school uniform in Australia don't have a school uniform in Sweden and um, so that's very different I'm not used to that I'm not used to you know being the mum of a child that needs to have a school uniform I have no experience of this and I have to make her lunch in the morning you get a cooked school lunch in Sweden so I have I don't have memories of my mum making me a school lunch I don't know I don't know what to put in a school lunch so I have to make decisions and I don't know I don't have anything to base my decisions on and yes just from the start from you know having a child in a different country like the healthcare it's very different here when you're pregnant and you you go to a doctor and you go to the hospital very different and then having time off work the parental leave in Australia completely different to Sweden I think in Sweden you can get 18 months off work partly paid whereas here only recently only for my second child did I have paid parental leave and that was only for 16 weeks I think and it's that's like the minimal wage level and um, so that's different and the whole culture of childcare or staying at home with children it's different I think often people say opportunities are different like in Sweden I think most parents go back to work most mums go back to work after 18 months or they go back after one year and then the, the, the father will have six months off but very rarely are you home longer with your children, I think. I don't know if it's changed in the past few years, maybe with higher un unemployment, more mums stay home with children. I'm not sure, but I don't think they do as much as they do here in Australia. I think in Australia, the opportunities to go back to work are probably not lower, but it's in the culture more that, you stay home with your children and one reason for that is probably that the child care costs are quite high here in Sweden it's subsidized and I think you have the right for, to have child care for your children whereas in Australia you pay for it and you get it but it's it's not your right, like um, you would say in Sweden. Um, so you have to balance all these things. This is often maybe continued career is important and valuable to you. So the childcare cost is worthwhile. If you have a job that's not really going to lead you anywhere in your career or if it's not something that you're happy with being at home with your child is probably more worthwhile if you don't have a very high salary and um, yes it's just the culture is so different and I, I have I mean I do work part-time from home but I have still not been working within my field for five years and I would never imagine that would happen if I was in Sweden and sometimes, I don't know if it's because I'm Swedish and the culture I grew up in, I can feel a little bit guilty about that because your work and your career is so much a part of what describes you and identify you as a person. And I never imagine myself being a stay-at-home mum. And I can feel guilty about that. At the same time, I can also... Feel really happy that I have the opportunity to be home with my children more than I would what well, then I potentially would if I lived in Sweden um, having my children in childcare five days a week and only seeing them at nights then and then during the weekends so 
So, um, I can't say that I like one option more than the other. Um, I think it's just very different. And um, both works. It's just when you when you have grown up in one culture and you have all this background experience from one country and then you go to different countries, you don't realise the difference in so much when you live in a different country until you have children yourself. Then all the differences in about making decisions starts to arise and you you realise all these things so if you're in a different country and with a boyfriend maybe you just wait all of a sudden you're there with children and you don't know how you got there <laughs> oh that was a lot of rambling and I'm going along again on this episode Oh, it's cold out there. <laughs> I am going to go and heat up my rose hip soup in the microwave. Because that's cold now. I'll heat that up, warm up a little bit inside. Maybe I'll get a couple of roasts done. Maybe I can finish my square before my little one wakes up. This one here. Um and then I have some reports to do for end of May for the accountant. And um, yes, that needs to get done too. But now that I have, have talked to you and I have had my crafty um, hour and show and tell, I feel full of energy to deal with all these other jobs and... Um, I'm so happy that you're watching. I'm so happy that I I can do this with you. I really appreciate any comments and feedback, any likes and um, follows and Instagram and you know if you join the group, you'll make me so happy. <clears throat> Sorry, I am. Um, I've also had questions about spinning and more about dyeing. A lot of sort of introduction to these things and how to get started. And I do plan to talk more about, about those things. I just need to have the time to think about it a little bit and how to go about it and what resources to share with you. I don't feel like I have enough to go as deep into it as I did with my other dyeing that I talked about. And it's really hard to show some of the things. Like with, with spinning, I'm not really sure how to show you. Um, I can show you my skeins of handspun that I have made previously and talk a little bit about them. So I might do that at some point. Um, we'll see um, but any more questions anything else you'd like me to talk about um, please just let me know I try to keep it at the end of the episode like this time because you, as you could see I just talk a lot about all this stuff and I couldn't even can't even get it from my head out through my mouth in a way that makes sense so it takes me a lot of time to discuss <laughs> these different things so I keep it at the end of the episode so people don't have to suffer through it if they're not interested. Um, yes. Uh, please come back and watch again and have a wonderful two weeks or so until I see you again. And thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll see you next time. Take care.